asking the question, what is this fullness of time that Paul talks about in Galatians 4? So let's start in Galatians 4. This was our um, Sunday before Christmas lesson that ties in with the Christmas season and then we kind of got sidetracked talking about the historical reliability of the story. But we were taking as our starting point this statement that Paul makes in Galatians 4, where he says in chapter 4, verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. What does he mean, fullness of time? Now, here's what I hear him saying, Rodney, that the story of redemption began in earnest when the time was right. I just told you a lot right there, didn't I? What does the fullness of time mean? It means when the time was right. What were you going to add? Well, I was going to guess, and that's all it is. Yeah? But that sounds good. Okay. Well, what was your guess? Oh. Well, they were all these prophecies that were going to unfold. Okay. And then it had to happen, right? Okay. So when they unfolded, and the time was right. <laughs> and the time was right. The fullness of time. What does that mean? Mm. That, that's what verse 4 says. Whenever it was, it was the right time. Right? Kind of like the second coming. We could say about the second coming too, couldn't we? When the time was right. Wish I knew when that was. Right? Well, why do you think God sent His Son to earth when He did? When He did. Now, this is quite a question for an arrogant postmodern audience that thinks they represent the high point of all human history. And you have to acknowledge that's true. You have to acknowledge that we kind of look at ourselves as the high point of educational and technological advancement. Um, we can communicate instantaneously around the globe, right? There was, a, there was an idea several centuries ago as part of the, uh, what's known as the Enlightenment, that said the more educated and the more advanced we become, the more civil we will become. And we'll be able to solve all human problems through education and medicine and technology. And there were even some of our forebears in the Restoration Movement, that's what we are, by the way, there were some of our forebears in the Restoration Movement that bought, bought into that completely. And they thought as the world's golden age, as the Enlightenment dawned on all, um, once that happened in its fullness, then the Lord would come back. They believed that we could become so good through education and technology and things like that, that that would bring the Lord back. We would become actually a fit... Um, society for his return. It, it, it dawned on them, it did. Only problem was it didn't dawn on the rest of humanity that that might happen. And so just ask yourself, uh, we'll just start in the mid-1700s, how much better are things now than they were in the mid-1700s? Have we er eradicated disease and poverty and racism? and No. No, we haven't. In fact, with the dawn of Twitter, now we just know more about all that. Right? Now, listen, with the dawn of social media, now we see just how corrupt people are all around the globe. So we have, uh, maybe we have uh, some medical technologies, maybe we have some uh, computer science capabilities. Human heart hasn't changed, and if anything, it's getting worse, because now we know just how bad, or we are finding out just how bad everybody really is. The Enlightenment didn't work. It's not working. 
We are not going to be, create a society on earth that is so good the Lord's just going to have to come back. That ain't going to happen. We will, we will. But uh, grace, and, well, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Right. We want, to, we want to be able to work so well, right? And that's kind of what happened because we decided we could work things out so well, we didn't need God in the picture anymore. We hold the germ within our hands, Right? I mean, who needs the great physician when you've got the best health care money can buy? And who needs a mansion over the hilltop when you live in wherever the richest part of Circe is? <laughs> I have to be careful about what I say there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's right. That's right. We still want to be God. The, the human heart didn't really change. The gadgets with which we sin have become more advanced. But the seed of the sin, still the same old corrupt human heart. So before we get all excited and say, well, why didn't he come back when we were here? <laughs> Man, it's probably a good thing he didn't, right? Because I'm afraid the Pharisees, uh, well, they'd still be Pharisees, but he might find them in a different place. I guess is what I'm saying. So we're, 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 we're asking this question. What, what was it about that first century Roman world that made it the right time. That was one of the reasons is, is that Rome ruled the world. Now don't steal my thunder here. Well, wait, just... <laughs> <laughs> if Joe keeps going, I'll just... We'll just keep singing. No, I just... Don't steal my thunder, because that's what I'm going to talk about. What, what was it about the Roman rule, right, that, that may have uh, made a, a good time? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. You have to understand, and this is where we got off last week, you have to understand that the story of Scripture is a story rooted in history. You have to understand that. Okay? Um, it does not minimize our faith. It empowers our faith. But to understand the New Testament better, we have to study the historical, political, cultural, and religious developments that shaped the world into which Jesus was born. What was the world like into which Jesus was born? Is that same world into which Paul went on missionary journeys? That same world to which Paul wrote his letters, right? And we devote ourselves to the study of those letters. And um, I am not a big fan of reader response, criticism, or understanding where the authorial intent resides in the way the reader reads it. I don't think when a writer writes something, it means what you say it means. I think it means what the writer says it means. Now, it's, it's, it's very difficult, it's very difficult um, to divest ourselves of our importance when reading an ancient text. And what I mean by that is we all bring presuppositions to whatever we read. Do you know what I'm saying? We all have a set of ideas that we grew up with, we were taught in church, we were taught from our grandpas and grandmas or whatever, and we've, we've been educated in that, we've been steeped in that, and so when we start reading anything, we bring that prior knowledge and those presuppositions to our understanding of the text. And so sometimes we make the text say things it doesn't say because we don't understand what it's really saying. Now let me use a really simple illustration here that doesn't come from the biblical text. It comes from a, um, a Christmas carol that we sing, that we've been singing since the 1700s. Okay? And that Christmas carol is Deck the Halls. All right? Uh, Dawn we now our what kind of apparel? Now, what does that mean? Rainbow flags? We all running around with rainbow flags at Christmas time? No. We know that that word had a life of its own and a meaning of its own before modern times. And if we sing that song, if, if, a, if a teenager sings that song and has no understanding of what that word meant, He's going to have, or she's going to have, no understanding of what that song means. Do you understand? In 1800, 1890, specifically, it's called a gay 90. 
the 1890s. Yeah. And it had nothing to do with right. the sexual orientation, right? All right, so do you see how understanding the words and the times, it doesn't matter what you think that word means at all. You're going to misinterpret that song. You're going to misinterpret the Flintstones. Everybody on the Flintstones is having a gay old time. But it ain't what you think it means. All right, well, the same is true when it comes to study the biblical text. You have to have that understanding of the historical, political, cultural, and religious background. Have to understand, I don't have it written up there, but the, 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 the literary background. Have to know a little bit of that before you can undertake a study of a book that has been around a lot longer than you and I have. Joe. In other words, it's sons. Sons. Mm -hmm. or sons and daughters. So when you study the biblical aspect of what son means, especially in, in lieu of an inheritance, that's only just the double point. It, it's, you know, it's not just necessarily talking about gender. It's the firstborn son. Mm. Well, uh, but another way to view that as well is when Paul is writing letters to congregations, he's not just addressing the men. And a lot of modern translations have recognized that. And so we'll say in cases like my, my, my brothers, he's not just talking to the brothers. He's talking to the congregation of God's people. All right? So I, I, I hear what you're saying. All right? Yes. Because he's talking about everybody. Right. Male, female, slave, free, etc. are all considered sons. Right. Firstborn sons. Firstborn sons. So, there, so there's a deeper meaning there that, that we have to communicate. Okay. All of that being said, um, what, is, what is the world like into which the Messiah is born? That's the question we want to ask. What is the world like? And a couple of folks have referenced this idea of prophecy. And there's this passage in Luke 24. Uh, Jesus is about to depart. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Uh, what do we call, what do we call the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms? That is the Old Testament. Now, uh, what, what you may not recognize there, when we teach the Old Testament in our Sunday school classes, we teach that there are five divisions of the Old Testament, right? Law, history, poetry, major prophets, minor prophets, right? Well, that's not the way the Hebrews conceived of their scriptures. They didn't see five divisions. They saw three. Now, it's all the same books, so don't get too excited. It's all the same books. But they called them Torah, Ketuvim and Nevi'im. Torah, writings, and prophets. Now, Torah, prophets, and writings. It's called the Tanakh. Okay? They only had three divisions. Torah is the law of Moses. Nevi'im is the prophets. Psalms is the head of that group they called the writings. So when Jesus says this in Luke 24, there are a couple of things that that communicates to me. Number one, that the Old Testament as we now have it, was already set in place by the time of Jesus. I think that's a big deal. Uh, because there are a lot of people who want you to believe certain weird things about the way we got our Bible and uh, that the books that we have are the result of, 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 of you know, um, backroom deals made by the Catholic Church and the white smoke. No, no. The Old Testament that we have is the same Old Testament Jesus had. And he recognized that, and he said, look, everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Writings. And so in order to understand what this fullness of time means, you've got to understand that the story begins in the Old Testament. And, and, and I, I'm going I'm to preach and teach this until the day I die as one of the defining themes of my preaching and teaching career, that we must understand our present story in terms of the entire story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We cannot keep calling ourselves New Testament Christians and think we're communicating appropriately because we are not. 
Okay? We are people of the book. This is our story. Genesis is our story. Abraham is our father. Right? So the, the whole story from creation to consummation. So we've got to take the time to study a little bit of Old Testament history. So let me give you a, a, a rundown of Old Testament history that gets us to <laughs> Galatians 4. All right, this, is, this is, goes into a lot of what we've been studying in Isaiah. Old Testament history closed with the Assyrian exile of the northern kingdom of Israel and the Babylonian exile of the southern kingdom of Judah and then the return to Palestine of some of the exiles under the Persian rule in the 6th and 5th centuries B.C. In other words, what that means is God creates Adam and Eve to be a kingdom of priests. Uh, they betray him, begin their own kingdoms. God calls Abraham out of the kingdoms of the world and says, your family is going to be my kingdom of priests. They betray him and their descendants betray him. That's where we get to the Assyrian exile. God says, all right, if Abraham's not going to do this, if your family's not going to do this, all right, uh, you're, you're, you're going to be on the naughty list. And so the kingdom of Israel is divided into two new kingdoms, the northern kingdom known as Israel, the southern kingdom known as Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel lasts until 722. They're destroyed because of idolatry. The southern kingdom lasts until 586. They're destroyed because of idolatry, but... In 539, Cyrus and the Persians defeated the Babylonians and told these exiled peoples, you can go home. They went home. Now this is a big deal because I've told you before that God uses nations, whether they know Him or not, whether they realize it or not, to accomplish His purposes. So what did the Assyrians and the Babylonians bring? Judgment. They brought judgment on Israel, just like Israel brought judgment on Canaan, just like Israel brought judgment on Egypt. God used Assyria and Babylon to bring judgment on Israel. And in Isaiah, he calls them, my servants, Cyrus, my shepherd, my anointed one. Okay? He uses the same language of them that he uses of Israel because they are accomplishing his purposes. Well, the story doesn't end with the Persians. Okay? The Greeks are going to do away with the Persians, and then the Romans are going to defeat the Greeks. But I want to show you a text. I want to show you a text. Let's go to Daniel 2. Daniel 2. Daniel 2... is a story about King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians having a dream. The ancients believed that the gods communicated sometimes in dreams. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, now this is the Babylonian king who's responsible for destroying Judah and Jerusalem. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then uh, the bureaucrats said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn from limb to limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream 
and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. All right, Nebuchadnezzar is not an idiot, right? Anybody can make up anything. Let me hear your dream. Oh, well, here, here's what I think it means, right? Anybody can make up anything. Nebuchadnezzar says, there's too much writing on the interpretation of this dream for me to chance you all being a bunch of charlatans. So, you tell me what I dreamed, and then I will know that you can tell me its interpretation. Shrewd move, right? And they're freaking out, because they know they can't do this. Well, the bureaucrats answered and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is... Oh, man! Do you see this? Whose dwelling is not with flesh. How many times have we said in this class that the ancients believed that the gods were human beings with superpowers that just kind of played with them like puppets on strings? How significant is it that Israel and its God, they can say, God is with us. And then God is with us in flesh. I mean, here, here's, there, there it is. There's the difference between the ancient conception of the gods and then Israel's and, and ours. Well, because of this, the king was angry and very furious commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. If you can't help me, I'll deal with you. The king sent out a decree that the wise men were going to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. We find out in chapter 1 that Daniel has set himself apart and his contemporaries, his friends, his peers, now God has set them apart. They've gained a reputation for being very wise and being blessed by the gods but they're part of this crew. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who'd gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show him the interpretation. <laughs> then Daniel went into his house and made the matter known to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and now you have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the king's matter. And so Daniel then intercedes on behalf of the wise men of Babylon, says, take me to the king, I'll tell the king the interpretation. Skip down to verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was one of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you looked, the stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that so not a trace of them could be found, but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now let me tell you its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of men, and the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over all of them. Again, here's this notion that God controls the destinies of the nations. You are the head of gold. You are the king that reigns now. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, 
strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things, and like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw, the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. Now, there are a lot of people that look at this and say, well, there are five kingdoms here, right? The iron and then the iron and clay. But I think the text makes pretty clear that the iron and the iron and clay are one kingdom, okay? And as you saw, the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it should be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw, the iron mixed with soft clay, so they shall mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, we read this whole passage just to get to this verse. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from the mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation, sure. Now, this vision is repeated in chapter 7. It's the same vision in chapter 7, although it comes to Daniel. And it's not an image that represents world kingdoms. It's different animals that represent world kingdoms. And if you read that text, all the animals that represent world kingdoms are ravenous beasts. And so that's a point we've made before in this class that in Scripture, in apocalyptic Scripture especially, the kingdoms of the world are presented as predatory beasts. And of course, in the middle of all those predatory beasts stands one like the Son of Man, who, to whom is given all the power and the dominion and things like that. Uh, the kingdom of God is a humane kingdom as opposed to the predatory beasts of the world. But the significant part of this is this notion that God is telling Daniel... And Nebuchadnezzar, what's going to happen? The gold represents Babylon. The silver represents Persia. The bronze represents Greece. And the kingdom of iron and clay, partly strong and partly brittle, represents Rome. And Daniel says, according to this dream, that in the days of those kings, that is, in the days of this Roman Empire, God is going to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It will not be overcome by any other coming kingdom, and it is the one that will last forever. Well, as we look uh, at the history of things that have happened, we know that this is, this is how things have played out. The Babylonians are overthrown by the Persians. The Persians are overthrown by the Greeks. The Romans were then uh, hot on the heels of, of the Greeks. And it was in the days of the Roman Empire that God sent His Son into the world. Now, what was it about the Roman Empire? I want to I pursue that for just a moment. What was it about the Roman Empire that created a ripe environment for God sending His Son? Okay? Look at this slide. The Romans took control of Palestine in 63 B.C. So we've gone now from 539, the Persians, through the Greeks, through the Romans, to now 63 B.C. Our first emperor is known as uh, Augustus Caesar. And um, it, it was interesting that when these Caesars were born, uh, they would proclaim the new king's birth throughout all the realm. Does anybody have any earthly idea what words they used to uh, proclaim the new Roman emperor's birth throughout all the realm? Well, I wish I'd brought a picture of it so that you would believe me. But they used these words. We bring you tidings of great joy. For today has been born a Savior who is... Does that sound familiar at all? I think it's interesting that Luke records the angel's words um, right in direct opposition to the Roman edicts, to the Roman tidings of joy. 
Uh, he's saying, yes, a king is born today, and he is the real savior of the world, and this is the real reason for good news. You'll find that a whole lot of what happens uh, in Revelation, like the symbols that are used, the language that's used, it is all meant to be a direct opposition to uh, a full frontal onslaught against what the Romans were doing and saying. And this was nothing new. There are Psalms in the book of Psalms that we have pretty good understanding were originally written to talk about some ancient other deity that the Israelites took and rewrote to celebrate Yahweh. Psalm 29 is one of those. You can look at it on your own time. But notice how God used the powers that be to fulfill His plan. Each one of these groups brought something to the table to prepare the time. All right? So the Babylonians brought judgment. They brought judgment on the Davidic house. And uh, if we had time, we would talk about some of the things that happened as a result of that. You know, God makes this promise to David, your family's going to be on the throne forever. I'm going to use your kingdom to do some great things, but if your people sin, I'm going to punish them. And part of that punishment is, is judgment. Um, but, but some good positive things actually come out of that. We just don't have time to talk about them. But the Babylonians bring judgment. The Persians bring return. All right, so the Persians allow the people of Israel to come back to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, all right? They're never free after that. They don't have a king after that. But the Persians bring the people home. When Alexander the Great conquers the Persians, one of the things Alexander the Great wanted to do to unify his empire was to unify it through culture. All right, the Babylonians sought to unify the empire through the Iron Fist. Exile, humiliation, intimidation, keep them down. The Persians sought to unify their empire by letting them go home. Rebuild your cities, pray to your gods, let's, have, let's just all be brothers. The Greeks sought to unify their empire through culture, common culture and common language. Now this is a big deal. Right? What was the common language of Alexander the Greek, the great empire? The language that becomes the lingua franca, the, the common trade, travel, communication language of the Greek world. What was that? What was the common language of the Greek world? Common language of the Greek world. It was Greek. Now, Joe... I remember hearing sermons a long time ago. And I always feel like I need to say my dad didn't preach this, just, just so you'll know. I didn't hear it from him. But I remember growing up hearing sermons about the special Holy Spirit language in which the Bible was written. Did anybody else in here hear that, or was that just a Northeast Arkansas aberration? I, I've heard that sermon more than one time. You know, the Bible written in a special Holy Spirit. Yeah, the special Holy Spirit language is the language everybody in the world at that time spoke. It was Greek. Koine, common, everyday, trade and travel, Greek. And that's what your New Testament is, is written in. That, that's kind of a big deal. I, I'm a firm believer that God wants to communicate with us so clearly, and He wants to make sure that nothing's missed. Um, that he uses the languages and the forms with which we are most familiar to communicate with us. And this is part of what Alexander brings to the table, this language that becomes worldwide. And so the Greeks bring language to the table. Here's what the Romans bring. Unity and stability. All right, with that in mind... Uh, Rome was noted for her insistence upon law and order. By means of provinces and districts closely supervised by local governors, the empire was efficiently administered. Now, remember when he says, um, remember when Daniel says it's going to be iron and clay, it's going to be strong, it's going to be brittle. Um, I think it's kind of like what we've got going on in the United States. We've got this federal government that likes to overreach things. 
the strong federal government led by an executive branch in Washington, D.C., and then we have all these other districts with their governors. We call them states, right? And we call them governors, and they're supposed to have some freedom, and they do have some freedom, but then you've got this federal overreach. You've got something very similar going on in ancient Rome. We've got a strong Roman government, uh, you've got a, a strong Roman emperor, and then you've got all of these districts and these little governors that are given some, uh, given some power, okay? In the providence of God, the Romans prepared the world for the coming of Christianity. How did they do it? I've got about five things here I want you to consider. Number one, this Roman peace. The unity and stability of Rome. You probably learned about this in world history called the Pax Romana. Okay? The Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was a 250 year period of peace based on Rome's ability to guarantee law and order. In, in other words, if your governor is not going to integrate the schools, we will, we will send the federal government down there to do it. All right, just, just to use an illustration you might be familiar with, right? So you've got, you've got Roman soldiers, Roman posts in all of these places, and if anybody steps out of line, the Romans will put you down. This is why Jerusalem will eventually be destroyed in, in, in 70 A.D. because the Jews don't like living under other, you know, regimes, and so they're always rebelling, and the Romans won't stand for it. This is why in the writings of Paul there is such an insistence that the people mind their own business, play well with others, and don't do anything to bring undue attention to yourself. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, when you come together, don't let it be with hands raised to fight. If you're going to raise your hands, make sure it's lifting holy hands in prayer. Right? Uh, and and uh, 1, Thessal 1 Thessalonians, um, make it your ambition to lead quiet and peaceful lives. All right, back in that 1 Timothy 2 passage, pray for the kings. Pray for those who have authority on you, all right? Because you don't want to tip off the Roman government that you're troublemakers because the great thing about the Roman peace, the terrible thing about the Roman peace was that it wasn't peace through, why can't we just all get along and be brothers? It was peace through, we've got the biggest bombs and the most money, and if you step out of line, we will blow you into oblivion. So, peace. I, this, is, um, this is part of the problem with the book of Revelation. Uh, you've got one segment of society in the first century that's talking about this great peace, but everybody knows that this peace is through force. It is a coerced peace. It is a threatened peace. It is a peace based on Rome's ability and its promise that, by God, there will be peace. All right, do you understand? It's not real peace. Um, these are still oppressed, threatened people. All right? We like to say in the United States of America, you're free to be whatever you can be. You're free to practice your religion. You're free to hold your viewpoint to a point. And then we're not going to take it anymore. Right? You're seeing this happen more and more. You all thought I was crazy preaching through Revelation that we were living through some of the things that Revelation was doing. But when you've got cities in the United States of America saying your business doesn't deserve to do business here because of what we think makes for peace, and if you don't do it, we will put you out of business and ruin your family and ruin your future. See, that's, that's Pax Romana. That's a Roman peace. It's not the rule of the Prince of Peace. But on a more positive note, the Roman peace allowed for some other things like this, the Roman roads. I know you've heard about the Roman roads, right? I, I, maybe not in the way that I'm going to present it. But one of, the, one of the things about Roman peace was the Romans built roads to connect all of the places in their empire. Okay? And these roads... Um, were the best constructed and safest roads in the ancient world. Now, there were always highways and byways, but we're, we're talking about uh, some paved roads. We're talking about roads with lighting 
and drainage and uh, well this right here that there is a mile marker that tells you how far you are from Rome uh, this little piece of highway right here when Paul leaves Philippi and heads down the road to Thessalonica that's the road right that's known as the Via Ignatia the Ignatian way it was a 493 mile strip of, of interstate if you will that connected parts of the Roman Empire uh, my point about this that the good news about having state troopers everywhere in your empire is that you can you can travel and you can trade and these roads are lighted they're drained they're patrolled they're informed and when it came time for a guy like Paul to go on the road with a message of the gospel this really came in handy right because he's able to travel now sometimes he travels by ship but most of the time he travels by foot or by hoof across the Roman Empire because of what the Romans were able to do all right he's able not only to travel he's able to send mail because of these roads all right let's look at another one the Jewish dispersion we'll have to end here so we have the strong government that's able to ensure peace and safety as long as you're not causing too much trouble we'll, we'll take care of you we build this interstate system it's gonna allow you to trade and travel and send letters but one of the results of the Babylonian exile was that the majority of Jews seemed to live outside of Palestine all right so the Jews are exiled they're dispersed they're now living in the four corners of the earth so when Paul hops on his donkey and heads out across the empire if you've ever read about this in the book of Acts you know that every time he goes to a city where's the first place he goes in every city all right what's a synagogue it, it's it's a Jewish community center it's what it is it's where the Jews worship it's where they educated their children it's where they settled community disputes your life was wrapped up in the synagogue there's no more temple in Jerusalem so where do you all get together you get together at the synagogue well, every city that had at least 10 Jewish men could establish a synagogue now think about this I don't know about you I'm not a church planter I can't imagine moving into a place that has no idea about Christianity and just setting up church I have no idea how to do it there are people that are especially trained to do that I'm not one of them okay so how's Paul gonna do this before there are books written about church planning what Paul gonna do well the thing about it is there are communities of God people in every one of these cities there are communities of Jews in almost every one of these cities Paul in other words has a ready-made audience in every city to start preaching now we're, we got to go back to the Babylonian exile to really understand how God is working through the centuries to get to this moment now we've got Jews in all these places remember Acts 2 when Jews from all these places returned to Jerusalem for Pentecost right and then they went back and now here comes Paul and the other Christian missionaries going to these cities with ready-made audiences people who already know God who are already expecting the the, the 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 coming of a Messiah and Paul comes in and starts preaching to them about Jesus some of them accept some of them reject but then he has a little congregation and they turn to the Gentiles and it becomes this multi-ethnic thing that's part of this fullness of time right a, a peace and security that allows trade and travel trade and travel it becomes essential because what God has done already to plant people in all of these places all right I got two more things and we'll talk about those next week because people are getting antsy out there in the hallway some of you are looking around wondering when this is gonna be over it's gonna be over now I will come back to it next week